We're gonna launch into a cardiac imaging presentation in just a moment here, but I wanna give a shout out to the crew that's behind the scenes, making all of this possible here today with Rock From The Heart. If we were at a big live event, I would ask for you to give them a round of applause. Eric, Sean, Ryan, Amy, everybody who is helping on the back end to facilitate this all happening for you. Um, but if you could just take a moment, give them a little wink or something in your mind to thank them for their hard work and all their efforts since we can't give them a big round of applause here um, together. All right, I, one more reminder before we get into our next presentation, rockfromtheheart.org is a website that I want you to flag if you get an opportunity as a favorite on your toolbar. And I want you to go back there every once in a while to check out the latest blogs, new events to be able to check in on updates and things that might be happening. All right, let's keep the presentations going. We're now gonna be hearing from Dr. Joa Cavalante, and he is, uh, as I mentioned, talking about cardiac imaging. Uh, he earned his medical degree in Brazil and came to, came to the US for his residency and chief resident in internal medicine and cardiology fellowship at Henry Ford Hospital. At the Cleveland Clinic, he completed and was appointed chief fellow for the two-year advanced cardiovascular imaging training program, obtaining um, level three in his interventional echo cardiovascular CT and cardiac MRI programs. In 2012, he joined the, the faculty at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center and was the director of the Structural Imaging and Core Lab. In October of 2018, he moved to the Minneapolis Heart Institute and serves as the director of cardiac MRI, uh, structural CT, and cardiovascular imaging research center and core lab there. Uh, Dr. Joa Cavalcante has published more than 55 manuscripts, seven book chapters, and does tons of speaking engagements both nationally and internationally. You see her joining us today to talk about cardiac imaging. Well, good afternoon, and it's a pleasure to present here on behalf of uh, Minneapolis Heart Institute to you on this topic of advances in cardiac imaging. I am uh, João Cavalcanti from uh, Minneapolis Heart Institute, and I oversee the cardiac MRI lab and uh, do cardiac CT along with many other colleagues here tonight, Dr. Mirima, Dr. Nuo, and many others in our team. My assignment was to cover a little bit about cardiac imaging, which can be a huge topic. And I thought about over the next 20 minutes or so to cover in these, these three domains. The heart is a quite of a complex organ because for its proper functioning, it has to, you have to have a good pump that sucks the blood, a good pump that ejects the blood. You have to have good valves that make the blood just flow one way. You have to have a muscle that can suck and can eject. You gotta have good pipes that conduct the blood flow outside of the heart to the other organs. And you have to have this muscle being fed, not only by blood via the coronaries, but also a good electrical heart system. So all of that is happening million times throughout our lifetime. And I thought that imaging could be helpful in many other ways, but in these three domains here, coronary artery disease, evaluation of the aorta, as well as of valvular heart disease. So when we talked about coronary artery disease, those are the arteries that provide blood flow to the muscle, to the pump. And we know that heart attack and coronary artery disease remains the number one cause of death in this country, in many other countries. We have made enormous progress in terms of treatment of this disease into prolonging and survival patients, but the detection of whether or not you have coronary artery disease remains yet to be improved. We have technology, as I will show, but we wait for symptoms to develop before we can check. Not to say that cholesterol numbers are not important, and risk factors are not important because they are. But now we can look into the heart literally. And the way to do that, it's very easy. It's looking at the plaque of calcium. Wherever we see calcium, that tells a story that there was already an important battle that occurred. This battle occur and then the vessels become calcified. Sometimes you might have a plaque that is soft next to that hard plaque of calcium. The more calcium that a patient has, the higher 
the likelihood that we will be dealing with more extensive disease, as well as a greater likelihood of, obviously, heart events, heart attacks, and uh, obviously sudden death. The way to assess how much calcium you have on your heart, it is through this CAT scan called heart scan. It is a very easy, very low radiation, does not need contrast, you don't need any needles. And a lot of patients give us the feedback, that's the best investment that I have made. I never thought that it was that easy. And then you can quantify how much calcium you have in each one of the three coronary arteries. This will be compared obviously against your gender, against your age. We get, as we get older, many things go wrong, including the amount of calcium. But obviously there are patients and patients that depend on not only their chronological age, but the vessel age is what determines the outcomes. Why is the calcium also important? The amount of calcium that we call coronary artery calcium score or CACS. It's important because the more calcium, as I said, the worse the outcomes, but we can change this outlook. And this is a recent study from three years ago showing that patients that have a calcium score of zero, actually they don't derive so much benefit on being on cholesterol medications. On the other hand, if they have a calcium score that is greater than zero, if they take statin, look at this solid blue line, they do much better in terms of events than in patients that have a higher calcium but are not taking cholesterol medication. So it could be that despite the numbers of cholesterol being normal, one could still have calcium. Is that possible? Yes, it's possible. And that's why we need to look into the arteries. The guidelines actually from the American College of Cardiology and American Heart Association from a couple of years ago have said that for any patient that are still on the fence, should I take that cholesterol medication? My numbers are fine, but I have a family history, but I have some other history of comorbidities. If you look at the calcium, if the calcium is greater than 100 Augustine units or the 75th percentile for that age and gender, statin therapy cholesterol is indicated and should be used. How can we do that? If you're interested, I would say that this is considered the best investment on your heart health. Uh, there's a heart scan Minnesota at Abbott Northwest and many other centers too. It is uncovered by the insurance, believe it or not, I don't know why, but it's only a hundred dollars, which you know you could spend easily on a day uh, going to any place or ordering food for that matter. It is a reimbursable through flexible health spending account. Um, and what you would expect is that this test gets reviewed by a cardiologist like myself or other colleagues here. And then that report gets sent to your primary care physician, to you obviously, to see where do you fall into those numbers. Consider for any individual that have risk factors. And I would say probably not 35, but probably 40 or above 45. Uh, because you need a little bit of time to calcify these vessels. So, and again, this test is not for those that are having chest pain symptoms uh, or having chest discomfort, because for those patients, then we need to consider evaluation of flow into that vessel or look at the vessel again, but look with contrast. Typically, if you're having symptoms, your primary care physician or your cardiologist will request a stress test. That stress test is going to be important to detect where's the narrowest vessel and will be positive, hopefully, if there is a significant narrowing of that plaque, significant narrowing that, of that vessel by a plaque. Now you could say, oh, somebody had a negative stress test and then had a heart attack. How is that possible? Well, it is possible because heart attacks can occur in the presence of these vulnerable plaques, plaques that don't have a lot of calcium. You see just a little bit of spots of calcium. These plaques can rupture, and when they rupture, it accumulates a lot of thrombin that will bring the platelets, and the platelets will have a horrible party here, and it's going to clog up the vessel. So you could have, not you, but hopefully one could have a heart attack even when the lesion is not severe enough to be picked up by the stress test. So could we detect this more upstream? And that's the role that coronary CAT scan could do that. We know for a fact that, for example, when patients that present with chest discomfort, um, 
And even after they get triaged by a stress test, let's say that that stress test is equivocal or even positive, when they get to the coronary angiography, not everybody will have a blockage. So in patients that almost 400,000 patients suspected uh, coronary artery disease, either by symptoms or by positive stress test, more, little over a third of them had a lesion that was tight enough. And 32% were normal, normal by the angiogram. Could we do a better job? And perhaps that CAT scan now with contrast, that's different than from that calcium score that I talked before, could be a good way to evaluate these vessels because we can see not only whether they have calcium or not, but we can see if they are soft plaque, like in this case here. And these are the plaques that we wanted to intervene with cholesterol medications and with aggressive risk factors modification before it progresses or even before it gets calcified for that matter. So that's the role that imaging could play. And obviously patients come in any many different shapes and forms. You can see here an older patient that has calcium all around the main artery here called the LAD, the circumflex, the left main, and this patient is having chronic stable angina. This patient very likely will need a bypass surgery. Whereas this other young patient that has chest pain with exertion, family history that is positive, smokes, and has a non-calcified plaque, soft plaque. You see, it's not bright. Uh, and those are the plaques that can cause trouble. And the calcium score would be zero, right? Just by looking at this. So calcium score is not good if you're having symptoms, but calcium score is good if you're older and you wanna know about what is my risk moving forward. Now switching gears to now aortic valve or aorta disease. The aorta is definitely a big vessel that provides blood flow uh, throughout our entire circulation, provides blood flow to the brain, to the other organs, and serves as a conduit. And as a conduit, it should distend, it should be pliable, and it should have compliance. But as we age, atherosclerosis and hypertension settles in, and calcification for that matter, it makes these vessels stiffer. And so instead of them being more pliable, distensible, they're not going to be so um, compliant. And therefore that is going to produce some backflow into the heart at times. It can stiffen the heart muscle, it can stiffen um, also that aorta and that can produce hypertension. And also these vessels can dilate because of you know, uh, systemic hypertension or other conditions as we hear. As the vessel grows, in size, the wall shear stress, the amount of stress that that wall is being subtended will also increase. And why is that important? Because as the wall stress of the vessel increases, the greater could be the likelihood of rupture or tear of dissection as we hear. The larger the vessel, the less distensible it is because if it is too large, there is only so much that it can distend. It's much more pliable when it is still small and young and healthy. So the health of your arteries is important as well. For us to measure this aorta, uh, we need to do proper studies. And those are studies that we could use either a CAT scan or an MRI. You need to have three-dimensional imaging. Ultrasound echocardiogram is okay as a starting point. But whenever you see dilation, it cannot stop there. And that's one important take home message. Now, the way you measure also matters, not because you do a CT scan or you do an MRI, you have to do this properly. It requires these, what we call crosshairs. It requires multi-planar reformat so that we can align with the vessel properly and do these measurements. And this is just an example of sometimes measurements that we get from other centers or outside um, hospitals that they measure and uh, say, oh, the vessel is huge. When we do the proper measurement, this vessel has a normal size. So incorrect measurements can have consequences either way, by measuring incorrectly or by when measuring uh, you know, too small when in fact it is, might be larger. So we need to do this at a center that has expertise and that has the proper training uh, to do the proper acquisition and the proper measurement.
If we do it properly, then we will see dilations like that. This is a patient with bicuspid valve. We're going to talk about that. Um, and then they had this dilation of the root, uh, as well as the sinotubular junction in the ascending aorta. So the bigger that aorta, the greater the likelihood that this aorta might get into trouble. And the trouble here would be obviously this acute aortic syndromes or dissection or intramural hematoma or penetrating also. These are all complex names to say that the integrity of that vessel wall has been disrupted. And there's blood that is now flowing in between the layers of the aorta. That causes an immense pain that patient feels, sometimes back pain, sometimes dizziness, sometimes losing consciousness, uh, sometimes chest pain, sometimes breathlessness. And the tear will propagate, depending on where it started. And at times it starts at the site of maximal dilation. It can propagate as the blood moves from the pump, from the vessel, the aortic valve, aortic valve upstream and then downstream. So you have this classification or type A or type B dissection, Stanford A or Stanford B. Stanford A is whenever it involves the ascending aorta or the arch. If it involves the ascending and the descending, it's still called Stanford A. Now for Stanford B, it is if it involves the arch in the descending aorta. Why is the ascending or letter A is so important? Well, it's the proximal part, is the part that suffers the highest impact of flow of pressure, as we talked about. So it's pressurized and that tear can propagate rather fast. It can also come not only upstream to the brain vessels, but also downstream into the coronary arteries that provide blood flow to the heart, into the aortic valve, it can be a mess. So the ascending aorta, it's quite sacred in that sense that we need, to, if involved, we need to deal with it very quickly and these patients require operation uh, so that that process can be stopped. And then once the aorta, let's say, is repaired, then we can deal with the descending later, um, at the later stage. That's typically how it's done. Well, what are the important conditions that predispose that dissection? Well, we have to think about also connective tissue disorder, sometimes uh, everything that predisposes the collagen or the elasticity of these tissues to be increased. Marfan syndrome, very tall individuals, uh, individuals that have dislocation of the lens, sometimes luxa um, luxation of the joints, uh, sometimes this Erlen's Danlos syndrome, the skin becomes quite um, fragile. Uh, they can have a very increased mobility of the joints um, and lowest deeds, et cetera. So those sometimes are important because they will have genetic screening in the family members downstream. And obviously bicuspid aortic valve, as we hear about, is a common condition that can stretch, can dilate that aorta. In addition, also trauma, uh, sometimes iatrogenic instrumentation of the aorta from other surgeries, catheterization, et cetera. When these vessels dissect, as I mentioned, they cause pain and we need to intervene quickly. We need to diagnose quickly with a CAT scan. And that's what it shows here. The true lumen is the lumen that received that contrast and the false lumen is the one that is where the tear, the, the tear is occurring. And it's separated by this membrane, which is the dissection flap. The true lumen tends to be the smallest one as shown in here. And sometimes if it gets compressed, we have to create a hole so that we can communicate and depressurize so that the blood flow can get into the other, particularly abdominal vessels. It is a process that obviously time is the essence and mortality is high if these patients don't get properly recognized and treated at expert center. So it involves a multitude of individuals and that's from imaging to make that a quick um, decision, diagnosis and communication to the, take, the primary team. After these patients get intervened on, in this case, for example, is a 27-year-old patient with Marfan syndrome, he had a type A dissection that did not involve the root. So the root of the valve was spared, although now he has aortic regurgitation or a leak of that valve. is a trileaflet valve, one, two, three. But 
that ACNA order was replaced. You can see that there is a graft here that comes all the way up to the arch. And then you have that residual dissection. So why this was not taken care of at the same time? Well, because that would have been even a longer operation than what he had undergone already. So that type B can be followed. And we need to make sure that this does not further dilate. And you can see that the blood flows through both the true and the false lumen. And so these patients will need to be followed, uh, obviously for the um, continued uh, dilation that these vessels can uh, have. And you can see here at every pulsation, you can see the true lumen here and the false lumen at the descending uh, thoracic aorta around this level here. Okay, so we talked about bicuspid valve. Bicuspid valve is a very common uh, congenital heart disease, up to 2% of the population, probably the most common congenital heart disease. It is autosomal dominant, meaning that you need to screen the family members every generation, although some of them might not exhibit the phenotype. Very common also in males and females. It was responsible for about a third of the aortic valve replacement cases in the United States. So bicuspid valve comes in many shapes and forms. It can have a dilation of the root. It can have a dilation of the aorta all the way to the arch, as you can see. Sometimes it can be associated with coarctation of the aorta, which is a narrowing of that aorta right after it passes the arch. Sometimes these patients need to have surgery because there's not going to be enough blood flow going to their legs. And uh, that can be a, a cause of significant um, compromise. Other modality that we can use to evaluate the order is the MRI. And the MRI uh, is that, you know, we don't need contrast. So especially for patients that have uh, more advanced chronic kidney disease, uh, even though, you know, it's not a contraindication nowadays, but you could use that and you can get measurements very similar to cardiac CT. Now, another issue that has been also uh, evaluated and investigated in research with cardiac MRI is, why is that patients that have bicuspid valve have this dilation of the aorta? Not everybody has, but some of them will have. And this problem could be related to the way the valve opens. So the 4G flow, uh, which is what we see here in a normal patient that has three leaflets, when the valve opens, all these path lines, they follow a very nice and smooth uh, flow pattern. There's no eccentricity of the blood flow. You can see that they all flow together. Now contrast that with a patient that has bicuspid aortic valve. And what do we see here? We see a significant eccentricity of that blood flow, a vorticeal flow. And this vorticeal flow with this very eccentric blood flow can increase the wall shear stress to the wall and produce the dilation of that vessel. And this is just another uh, picture here that this is a, an active area of research and there might be some uh, implication of that blood flow before and after valve surgery that we might need to understand better. All right, to finalize then, what about valvular heart disease? Have you heard of valvular heart disease or have you had your valves checked? Well, we have four valves in the body. We talked about the aortic valve but there are three other valves. So this is the pulmonic valve. We have the mitral valve, tricuspid valve. We have the pulmonic and we have the aorta. So the mitral and the tricuspid, they separate the upper chambers from the lower chambers, the atria from the ventricles. And as I said before, valves are very dumb. They only are meant to be, to make them sure that the blood only flows one direction, that the blood does not go back. So in this case here, the blood comes from the legs into the tricuspid valve, into the right ventricle, into the pulmonic valve. On the left side, it will come from the lungs into the mitral valve, and then through the aorta into the main circulation. And this is a closed circuit that keeps occurring on and on and on. So when these valves are defective, however, then there's going to be problems, right? Because they might then make this pump less effective because the blood, instead of moving forward, is coming backwards. Or instead of moving very swiftly, it is moving with a very high resistance. So who is at risk? Obviously, age with many things, 
Um, obviously, other predisposing conditions, endocarditis, uh, rheumatic fever, um, heart failure, atrial fibrillation, coronary artery disease, uh, heart attacks can distort the heart muscle and can make valves less effective, or congenital birth defects. We talked about bicuspid valve or sometimes fused valves. And knowledge is anything here. This is not only for valves, but for all that we have been talking about is key when we can apply it. And Valve Heart Disease Awareness Day is coming up now on February 22nd, this coming Monday. And that would encourage you to dial in at the Minneapolis Heart Institute Foundation website that we're going to have expert conversations about that. But 60% of people that have heard of heart valve heart disease, only 9% of them know a great deal about it. 15% know somewhat. And of those 65 and above, 30% of them have no idea where is the valve heart disease. And why is that? Well, because at times, you know, even, you know, primary care physicians sometimes ask cardiologists, um, we have been trained to wait for symptoms or to not check more proactively. The signs and symptoms of valvular disease can sometimes be confused with aging. So shortness of breath, fatigue and exhaustion. Well, I could be right now tired because it's the end of the day. Um, or I have you know, done something that is very strenuous. But that sometimes can come from the valves. Dizziness, weakness, chest pain, chest tightness can be confused with coronary disease as we talked about, fainting, lightheadedness. But should we continue to then wait until we have symptoms or could we do this much more upfront? Well, the stethoscope is one way. I would argue that this was a state of the art more than 300 years ago. It's still valid to listen to, but the patients are getting bigger. And sometimes you might be falsely reassured that you have no valve issues uh, when you cannot hear a murmur that is actually there. So put the probe take a look with the ultrasound. And that's what um, even handheld devices now are available that could be at least the starting point. And as we talked about before, sometimes you need to go for other testing like the CAT scan and MRI, but not for everyone. But whenever we need to consider that this problem is not only in the valve, but it could be in the muscle, it could be on the, on the vessels. So, this is just to show that aortic stenosis is one of very common disease. Um, it, it causes the narrowing and calcification of the valve. And the consequence of that is that the heart can become either super stiff and thick or the, valve, the heart muscle can dilate. And when you get to that condition, hopefully not at any time soon, uh, it is important to consider what's the quality of that muscle. And that's where MRI could be helpful to pick up areas of scar that you know could show that this heart has undergone some damage. So once the symptoms developed, the clock has started quite some time before because the damage might already be there, but you gotta act quickly. And nowadays we have many ways to take care of this. And one of the ways is obviously to do what we call this transcatheter aortic valve replacement therapy procedure. This is just an example of a procedure that is done through the groin we we'll bring this valve inside the old valve that is not working well, and we can deploy this valve very safely and these patients can go home pretty much next day. Uh, we never remove the old valve uh, and this other valve um, works immediately after. Mitral regurgitation is another problem that the valve on the left side is either billowing or prolapsing or rupturing like that, and that can cause the blood flow, instead of going through the aortic valve, the blood now is going to bounce back into the left atrium, which is receiving the blood flow from the lungs. And that's why these patients can be so short of breath because the lungs are trying to dump the blood into the heart and the heart is pushing back to the lungs. So it's in an effective pump, as you could imagine. And this can produce a murmur that can be heard. And finally, um, and this is just an example of a mitral valve regurgitation. And finally, the tricuspid valve, which is the valve on the right side. This is a valve that um, can fly under the radar screen for quite some time. Uh, the symptoms are very non-specific, but it requires a lot of thinking. Sometimes it can be related to a pacemaker, like in this case here. It could be um, avoiding or prohibiting the 
closure or the coaptation of these leaflets because the pacemaker is in the middle. Um, it sometimes it can be associated with atrial fibrillation. And the importance of that is that nowadays we have ways to not only see better this valve, and this is just an example of a CAT scan from our center that can show that this valve cannot come together anymore. You can see the big hole of this valve. And this can cause obviously substantial symptoms for these patients. And when they come, they don't feel good, but we can offer many therapies. But obviously we wanted to intervene way before this happens. So should I be worried? Fortunately, as many of the problems that we talked about here, if we are proactive, we can detect this early with better outcomes and many ways to get engaged and awareness like we're trying to promote here and this opportunity with Rock from the Heart, the advocacy is quite important for the patient. So please make sure that you listen to your heart, listen to your symptoms, and also listen to a healthcare provider that can image properly your heart. And with that, I would like to thank the opportunity again, and we'll look forward to some questions. Thank you.